Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce and today we're doing another Indie Horror Spotlight. I have with us today an indie author and he has a book that's coming be coming out towards the end of June and it's through Unveiling Nightmare and it's called Jeever. Jeevers. Or Jeevers. Yes, for Jeevers. I have with us today Alex. Hold on. <laughs> Whoa. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and today we're doing another indie horror spotlight. Today I have with us, he is an indie horror author, and he has a new book that's going to be coming out towards the end of June called Bejeebers, and it's through Unveiling Nightmare. I have with us today Patrick Winters. Patrick, welcome to the Horror Room. Hi there. Thank you for having me. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. So tell us a little bit about Bejeebers. So, uh, Bejeebers is a short story collection of mine that is set to feature 14 short stories of weird and horror fiction. Uh, they're stories that I've written across maybe the last five years or so. And uh, it's a weird title, and I've had it in mind for a while, and I thought it would go along with stories of mine that I thought were a bit more quirky and stories that were more for the thrills and chills and fun that goes with certain horror stories as opposed to things that are going to have you be stroking your chin and going oh very thoughtful this is mostly just for the fun of things it's amazing now now how did you line up with unveiling nightmare i mean they're amazing team of uh, i happen to see them uh posting on social media and uh, got in contact with uh, their head editor, uh, Crystal Bainham, and sent uh, sent my project off on a whim, hoping that it might interest them, and so far it has. Amazing, amazing. So, it, I mean, it took you five years to compile these stories. Mm -hmm. Now, once you, I mean, June is right around the corner, believe it or not. Now, how excited are you? to finally um, get this publication out there for people to actually see. I'm very excited. I've had uh, two short story collections that I've released on my own. Uh, I only ever released them through Barnes & Noble, so you can imagine that they didn't get into very many people's hands. So I'm very excited to finally having have, to have a press that will be releasing my work. And I've been publishing for going on uh, 10 years, uh, this March, as a matter of fact, it will be my 10-year anniversary of publishing short fiction across websites, anthologies, and magazines, and it's very thrilling to finally have something that is more substantial that's all mine being released by a press. I can imagine. That's an incredible feeling. Now, is it harder to write full-length books than, than short stories? Like, Is that your preference, doing short stories? For me, it's harder to write longer fiction. Uh, I guess I'm a bit gun shy with it because a few years ago I did have a novel length work that had been accepted for publication, but unfortunately the publisher went under before it could be released and uh, the publisher never alerted me to the fact that they were closing. So I had to find out about a month and a half after they had already closed down. It was pretty heartbreaking at the time, but looking back at it, it wasn't my best work. So I'm somewhat happy that it didn't come to fruition because I think I could do better if I were to ever release a full length novel. But absolutely, I'm more aligned with short fiction. I've always been more into that, both as a creator and a consumer. I grew up on things like uh, The Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt, Night Gallery, all of these anthology shows where you could tune in for half an hour to an hour and just get a quick dose of chills and thrills. And I think that's had a big impact on my own writing. That's great. And listen, I grew up in that stuff too. I love the short anthologies. I mean, even like Creep Show, I, I love that stuff. Now, by being a writer in the year 2024, there's a lot of writers out there who are doing the self-publishing. Mm -hmm. Do you, which 
sounds absolutely hard, you know, to do. I mean, yes, is it a lot easier to have a, a nice publishing company behind your back to help promote and market your project? Ab absolutely. It's again without it having this short story collection come out. It is a bit nerve wracking because I feel like there's this perception, at least to me, it if nothing else, that you need something more substantial out like a full-length novel ahead of doing short story collections because they're not seen as being as viable in some people's eyes as like a full-length novel. So being an independent publisher as I have been, it is very difficult to get yourself out there, to market yourself, to know how to get word out about what it is you're doing and what it is you want to do. So having a press behind me helps to know that there's at least someone already guaranteed to be in my corner to help get this out there. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think a lot of people, which I'm listening the, 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 the self publishing is amazing because it's giving a lot of authors who normally wouldn't have a way to get their work out there in front of people. It's give them an option. But as, but at the same time, you have to do everything yourself. You have to be good at marketing. You have to be good at sales. You have to be good at getting in front of people. You have to be good at promoting. Yes. And and that's something that you know most people. That's a, something that they don't have in their wheelhouse. Absolutely. And like me, I'm more of a reserved person. Normally, it's very awkward for me to put myself out there to promote my work, but I know it has to be done, but I always feel kind of like a jerk of going, hey, please read my stuff. Please <laughs> me. give me attention. So <laughs> it's, it's very much this mixed bag of having pride of being a writer, but also being terrified of putting yourself out there at the exact same time. I totally agree. Now, when, as a writer, when it comes to your short stories, now, do you already have an ending in mind when you start, or do you work for it backwards? Uh, that's the classic argument or clash of the uh, plotter versus the pantser, as I always hear it referred to. And usually I'm more of a plotter. I like to have a beginning, middle, and end in mind to at least go off of. Sometimes stories will naturally evolve and change as I work and go. But very rarely can I just get an idea and totally run with it. And when it comes to your ideas, do you just get them like, do, do, is your brain all, always going when it comes to coming up with stories and ideas? My or brain is never always going. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when it comes to my story ideas, they can come at, they can come at any moment and have before from just the simplest things. Sometimes I have to go looking for them. Other times the most random event will occur. Uh, I have a story that's long since been published that uh, began with just me walking outside one day, like during lunch, and I heard somebody shout in the distance. And from that, like an 11,000 word story came out of that one incident and the thought that followed it's it's a strange alchemy writing and do you have any rituals so when you get ready to write there's there a certain like do you have any rituals is there a certain time of day do you write is do you have to be playing a certain kind of music or do, do you need quiet do you have a room do you go to uh i usually write on my old ipad i just wherever i happen to be at and if the mood and the muse is speaking to me, as it were. I'll sit down and write, but preferably I like to just be in the darkness of my bedroom and crank up some music. I'm a hard rock and heavy metal fan, so I'll listen to things like uh, Parkway Drive, Architects, Bring Me the Horizon. Those are a lot of my go-tos that, for whatever reason, usually seem to get the creative juices flowing. Nice. Now, are there any authors that you get inspiration from, or even filmmakers? Uh, I don't know if it 
goes into my writing, but there are certainly writers that I envy and admire and filmmakers as well that have made me want to pursue the horror genre in particular. Uh, I have often said that I probably would not be where I am now writing horror if it weren't for Stephen King. Uh, he was one of those aha revelation moments when I was uh, like a preteen. For the longest time, we had a copy of his insomnia novel that was just sitting out in our hallway. And the cover of it always intrigued me since I was a kid. And I finally just decided to pick it up and read it. And uh, a lot of it probably, I remember it just went totally over my head being that young, reading it as a preteen, and yet I was hooked. And from there, I just started reading more and more of his novels and his short story collections. And again, being a fan of short story collections, I absolutely adore Clive Barker and his books of blood. Those are something that I've always strived to try to be as good as knowing that I will never be as good as that. But. <laughs> now, one thing, Patrick, that you don't know that I know about you is that you and I have something in common. Uh, we're both collectors of figurines. So ah, wonderful. Your figurine collection. Yes. You can see my G.I. Joe collection up there above my head. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> yep. So how long have you been collecting figurines? Oh, for years. I've always loved toys ever since I was a kid. And actually, it it really struck me uh, about a year ago when I finally kind of had this realization of this crossroads that has happened with my love of toys, comic books, and writing. Because some of my earliest attempts at writing came from taking the toys that I had of like old three quarter inch GI Joes and things like that. And I would give them new names and backstories. And I would write out my own little comic books about those characters <laughs> on crappy little lined notebook paper. So that that way I could have toys of like my own characters. And I loved doing that as a kid, and ever since then, I've had a passion for toys and the collecting. Obviously, I'm a big G.I. Joe fan, and as a matter of fact, I have a toy of myself. Nice. I joined the G.I. Joe fan club when I was, I think, 11. And this was a figure of myself that they sent me with a file card and uh, dog tags. And to this day, I remember my code name was Powerlander. I was a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> and yeah, it's stuck with me. And it is shown through in my writing because I had the honor of putting together, serving as a project leader, for the Odd Playthings anthology, which was released by Black Ink Fiction last year. I saw uh, that. At the time, they were looking for uh, authors to lead and come up with projects. And I thought, well, something that might be suited to me that I would have an interest in would be toy-themed horror. So I reached out to them, and we put out an open call, and last year released a collection of short stories all about toy themed horror. So what's your favorite toy themed horror movie? Ooh. All time. It's not a horror movie per se, but it has some horror elements and it immediately comes to mind with toy themed movies, but I've always loved small soldiers. Okay. That is, that is that's definitely a good one. I don't know why. I, I thought you were going to say Puppet Master or Demonic Toys. I do love the Puppet Masters, for sure. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, since I mentioned Stephen King, I love the episode of Nightmares and Dreamscapes that they did of Battleground with the Army Men going <laughs> after the Hitman. I love that. I remember seeing that on TV once, I think, when it initially aired. And for years, I could not remember what that was until <laughs> finally 
looking back through Stephen King things, I finally realized that it was the Nightmares and Dreamscape show, and I like immediately got it off of Amazon. It's crazy because in the eighties and nineties, I would say mid to late eighties and nineties, toy theme horror was huge. I mean, oh, yeah. of course, the big ones, Child's Play, but I mean, you also had like you know the the indie ones like demonic toys mm-hmm. um, band stuff like Chris, um, demonic toys and puppet master you had doll man yeah you had a lot of toy theme horror movies um even in the um tells what the hood tells from the hood i believe yeah tells from the hood um mm-hmm. anthology movie they had a toy theme yes uh, story. and i wonder if that's like you said with coming out late 80s early 90s is that a result of like the pop culture boom of all your 80s toy lines and yes. the fashions of like Cabbage Patch Dolls, Tickle Me Elmo, G.I. Joe, Transformers, that... My Little Buddy. Yeah, yeah. all of that, yeah. <laughs> because I, I, I had a My Little Buddy, I'm sure my age, but I, I had a My Little Buddy growing up. I grew up in the 80s. And, um, and, and Child's Play came out like a year or two afterwards. And it scared the shit out of me because I was looking at my my little buddy like, is he gonna come alive and kill me? <laughs> but that's, like, that's always an interesting thought when you're a toy collector. Of what if your collection would come to life? What would happen? <laughs> exactly, exactly. See, but so I now collect Funko Pops. Like that's mm. my, um, I, I collect some horror action figures. But I keep my stuff in the box, um, but I do have a couple. Old He-Man toys from back when I was a kid. Because I always kept my, my my toys in pristine condition. I even have the original Teddy Ruxpin in oh. working condition, um, and the original Brown Fisher Price tape recorder that mm. every kid had. Still got that <laughs> pristine condition. Nice, very nice. But um, but like I, I was talking to somebody recently. I was like, the action figure. Um, Action figure genre has kind of died with kids. Kids don't play with action figures anymore. That's why you go to now, you go to Ollie's or Five Below's, so you see a whole, you see shelves and shelves filled with Marvel action figures, DC action mm-hmm. figures, E Man, and like um, I even was in Ollie's. I don't know if they have Ollie's where you're at, but mm-hmm. I was in Ollie's yeah. recently, and they had the old um, Ghostbuster from the cartoon the, the mm. tv shows and i saw the egon that i had as a kid i was like oh my goodness like and kids don't play with action figures anymore i i, I think the action figure craze has kind of gone and i think only collectors really are the ones who actually s- still purchase action figures yeah absolutely and i f- i wonder if that's again because of the current pop culture that so many of those things from the 80s like, I was born in the 90s, so I got the tail end of a lot of your classic things like Transformers and G.I. Joe, of the tail end of those heydays for them. And I wonder if it's because, like, now with the popularity of Marvel movies and the DC movies and things like that, that what used to be considered, like, nerd culture is now more widely accepted and known by a greater audience so that's why some of this stuff has come back because we can look back and go, oh, I used to get bullied for liking that thing. Now it's the yeah. <laughs> thing to be into. And it's kind of this revival of all these things that we knew and love as kids. Yeah, cause I, I tell everybody, I said, well, I was in high school. I was a closet nerd, you know, I, yeah. I was an athlete. And, and I, by the same time, like, I will also, not only did I hang out with the jocks, but I also would hang out with the video game club and the chess club guys because I could talk to them about what I was really into, about, yeah. you know, the new video games and stuff like that. Because, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, going to school in the 90s, in the 2000s, early 2000s, it wasn't cool to be a nerd. And like <laughs> now, it's like now I'm like, boy, I was born in a wrong era because it's cool to be a nerd. Absolutely. I wear it with pride now. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> All right. So, Patrick, this is, as you know, this is a horror channel. So I'm going to ask you three mm-hmm. random horror questions. Are you ready, my friend? Absolutely. All right. First question 
horror movies. What was the f- first horror movie that scared the shit out of you as a kid? <sighs> the first thing that I remember traumatizing me was Ernest Scared Stupid. Really? <laughs> really? I I love that movie now. I absolutely adore it. I can it's one of those things that I can pop in at any moment. But watching that as a kid, that is made to terrify children because it's all about a troll that's collecting the souls of kids. <laughs> and I distinctly remember being a kid in my bed, rolling over, thinking I would see that damn troll right next to my bed. And uh-huh. it it really hit home for me as a kid. But for whatever reason now, I love it. I forgot all about Ernest. What happened to Ernest? Ernest was huge. Yeah. In the eighties and nineties. He was on every commercial. He had movies. Is he still alive? No. Jim Varney, he passed away several years ago now, I think. Wow. It's That's unfortunate. Sad. I I love those Ernest movies. I yeah. loved all of those as a kid too, but except for Ernest Scared Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Ernest and the and the Pee Wee movies. I love Pee Wee Herman. Mm. All right. Second question is: Is there a story that you have sitting on your shelf somewhere that you've written maybe years ago that for some reason you're waiting to the right time to release it to the world? Uh, not necessarily. There's ever since I was first published i've always come at it from the perspective that if i'm going to write something i'm going to try to find a home for it Mm -hmm. Uh, i've never really been the type that necessarily wants to keep it to myself which again is weird being the closed off quiet person that i tend to be (laughs) but uh I guess there, at the moment there's one story that is currently unpublished that uh, was inspired by my battle with cancer, which I had and was diagnosed with in 2020. I've since been in the clear. And the story takes a great deal from uh, particulars of that whole scenario. And... It's definitely one of those stories that I feel like will never be perfect. I've been reworking it and reworking it because I finished it a few months ago. And I have been trying to send it out there and gradually reworking. And that one's a process. Well, I will, listen, I will look forward to seeing that one, hopefully in the near future. I I hope you'll get to see it in the yes. near future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question. All right, I'm gonna ask you a tough one. Okay. What is one horror series that you wish they would stop stop making movies? Be done. Oof. This is. I'm gonna put a target on my back, <laughs> and I'm gonna say the Halloween franchise. I I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> I've just I've never been able to get into the Halloween films. I've seen I love most them. of them. Yeah. And I just I don't know. It's never quite worked for me. I love John Carpenter. I appreciate what he's done. I appreciate the legacy that that first film especially has gone on to have and the effect it has had on horror in general, let alone just filmmaking in general. But that franchise, I just can't get into it. And I watched the uh, first two of the newer trilogy from David Gordon Green. And I I was hoping that maybe that would be what would get me on board. And just, nope. (laughs) See, I agree with you. But I've always been. So the original Halloween is my favorite horror movie all all the time. Mm -hmm. Not my favorite franchise, but that's my favorite horror movie. But... I have a love hate relationship with her with the Halloween series, and especially that 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 last trilogy. Um, I and I actually enjoyed the first one. Uh, I thought, oh, this is an interesting swing of the Halloween. This is this is different. This is a 
uh, more cerebral, vicious Michael Myers. This is a nice new spin. I, it could have ended it right then, and I would have been like, okay, I'm I'm happy with that, mm. you know? But then they had to go and push out two more movies, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, oh, like, you know, this is some kind of fucking cash grab, and I just yeah. feel like I feel like the Halloween series has always been a cash grab. I mm. feel like majority of the movies is they're pushing out sequels or reboots just for money, and it has nothing to do with fans or something creative. It's literally takes XYZ filmmaker and put him there, and here's Halloween. Do something new with Halloween, and it's never good. Yeah. And I feel like with the franchise as a whole, it lives and dies by like how much you as a viewer put into it. Because I think that the most interesting thing about the franchise, and also sometimes the most poorly realized aspect for me personally, is the idea of Michael Myers being like this ultimate unknowable evil. I love that concept, and every now and then you get a moment throughout all the films that you get these moments where that's illustrated very well. Other times it's just like, okay, you're you're going too ambiguous with this and... You know what I mean? Yes. Now, Halloween, by the way, the last two Halloween movies pissed me off. They really did. Because, like, in Halloween Kills, it was insulting my intelligence. And I don't like to watch any movie that insults my intelligence. I'm like, there's no way in hell characters... Listen, I know in horror movies, characters are are stupid. But there's no way characters are that fucking stupid that long. (laughs) Or even towards the end, like, where they all surrounded him in their trucks and they decided to jump out and fucking fight him. I'm just like, well, y'all on big pucker trucks. Why don't we need to just run this motherfucker over, put it in reverse, and just turn him into a pancake? I don't care how <laughs> badass Michael J- Michael Myers is. If you flatten this motherfucker down like a fucking pancake, he's not coming back. It's done. But you decide to jump out of your vehicles and go one on one, not shoot guns or anything. One on one, fighting him with pipes and knives and fucking baseball bats. And this motherfucker just got done whipping like 10 fucking big, strong, badass firefighters by himself, barehanded. Like, doesn't make any fucking sense. I'm telling you, if I was in that situation, I'm like, I'm in a big pickup truck. I would run this motherfucker over and then put it in reverse and just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but the Halloween movies insult your intelligence. And I don't like that. Yeah. Yes. All right, Patrick. So where can everyone find you, my friend? Uh, I'm available on Facebook, uh, Instagram. I've recently rejoined Twitter or X or whatever they're cho- choosing to call it now. <laughs> uh, I have a author's website out there that uh, kind of collects all of my various publications through the years and ongoing and yeah, Google me, I guess. All right, everyone. Well, Patrick, it was have a blast having you on. Everybody, everybody, look out for Bejeebers coming through Unveiling Nightmare. Check out Unveiling Nightmare, too. They're amazing. And check out all of Patrick's work. I, mean, I saw that you have some work on Amazon as well. So, he mm-hmm. on Amazon, so please check him out. Look him on social media. Patrick, it's been a blast having you on. More than welcome. I would love to have you come in and just talk about collectibles, to be honest. I <laughs> would love to do that. Yeah, yeah. we could just have a collectible show and have a free-for-all and show off all of our collectibles. We need to do it. Yes, uh, I'm down. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care. <laughs>